Hello, I'm Jeremy Olmsted Thompson. And I'm Paul Mori. And this is the SIG multi cluster intro at KubeCon North America 2020. So, in this talk, we will cover what is the SIG about and how do you contribute. We will cover turning off one's camera in order to conserve storage space. What happened before now in the lifetime of the SIG? Uh, we're going to talk about KubeFed. We're going to talk about the concept of a cluster registry. And we're going to talk about what's currently happening. So we're going to talk about things like cluster set, cluster ID, um, namespace sameness, multi-cluster services API, the work API, cluster sets, and what do they mean? So what is this SIG about? Well, multi-cluster is an extremely broad topic that means different things to basically everyone. But our best definition is just making multiple clusters work together somehow. It touches many different functional areas. Um, we are really focused on trying to figure out what are those key primitives that, that you really need in all multi-cluster scenarios to, to make it work. And we need your input. We're, we're looking for real use cases. Uh, we're looking for, you know, understanding the projects you're working on, um, but we're going to tell you a bit about ours. So many of you are probably familiar with uh, KubeFed or Kubernetes Federation. Um, there's been a couple different versions of that. The first one was built before we had custom resource definitions and was really uh, uh, about spreading a single resource where that might be a resource of one of the, well, that was a, a resource of one of the built-in types that was pushed to different clusters from a central uh, cluster that hosted Federation and sometimes overridden. Um, the V2 Federation it took a similar approach uh, in the sense that there are uh, template resources that are spread to multiple clusters with overrides, but it heavily leverages custom resource definitions to create a new federation surface, federation API surface for any type. And this was a response to uh, one of the shortcomings of V1, which is that um, in V1, since we didn't have CRDs, there was no uh, just have a new part of the control plane for a new resource. Uh, so we leverage CRDs to create new API surfaces for any type. And if you if you take a look over there at the right hand corner of the screen, you can see uh, an example of a uh, federated deployment. So you'll see there we've got under spec, we've got a template that probably looks a lot like you would expect a field in a spec called template to look like. And then we've got a section called placements and overrides and those are sort of what they sound like. The placement one contains which clusters does this resource go to? The overrides contain how does it change in a particular cluster? So if you take a look there, you've got under overrides, it's a list. There's one item in it. Cluster name is cluster two. And the override says the spec replicas field should be five instead of three. So, um, Similar API regime and approach, but trying to address that limitation of V1 by using CRDs to generate new API surfaces introduced a new problem, which is that um, having a distinct API surface for the Federation APIs means that existing resources require transformation to be used with that API surface. So you couldn't just take a Helm chart, for example, and uh, use it with KubeFed V2 without some alteration or transformation. Um, and another point to mention here is that uh, we attempted an integration with the cluster registry, but the correct boundaries were never apparent. And in this, uh, in this presentation, we're telling the story maybe with a new ordering. Uh, we haven't talked about the cluster registry yet, but we're about to. So just remember that we tried to integrate KubeFed uh, 
v2 with a cluster registry and there were never really a clear good set of boundaries that's sort of a theme uh that we'll come back to perhaps about it if we could just head on over to the next slide so with all that said about qved v2 um, there's really no one size fits all solution in this problem space. If the model works well for some users, uh, and there's uh, definitely users and vendors that are out there using it, um, the the folks that are currently working on KubeFed are considering how to add pull reconciliation, where um, what the the contrast might mean uh, or means between this word that I uh, used earlier, push and pull, um, the push model is you've got something running in a cluster that's hosting KubeFed and it's pushing, making client connections to the clusters where resources are supposed to go and pushing to those things versus pull where you might be running a, an agent in the cluster that's supposed to have the resources that we're being pushed in the push model, and it's maybe watching a cluster that has the Federation API surface and pulling it in. So again, this touches that kind of cluster registry concept, um, but there, there's not a real clear boundary about what parts of uh, that problem a cluster registry would solve. I do wanna just pause here and say, uh, and, and give a, a shout out to Jimmy and Hector and others from D2IQ for helping to move this project forward. Thanks a lot. Your work is appreciated. Why don't we just head on over to the next one? All right. So that cluster registry thing we mentioned a couple times, you probably heard of this. Um, the history behind the cluster registry is that uh, in between KubeFed v1 and kubefed v2 there was a point within the community where basically the only thing uh that folks could agree on in this very spacious problem space um is that if you're working with multiple clusters it makes sense to try to track them and to have some registry type thing this is a very deceptive problem uh, as as problems uh, with computers can be. It seems simple. It seemed very easy at the time that we would just build a registry and you can sort of imagine what it might be. It seemed easy to us. It turned out not to be easy. As I said, um, there wasn't ever really a great boundary that was super clear about what should a cluster registry type thing do versus something that would be a user of cluster registry. Um, and if, if you actually go and look at the cluster registry project, you'll see there's, a, there's an API. There's no controllers to back it because we weren't sure what they should do. And that's maybe a good point for us to talk about what approach are we taking in the SIG today? So with everything Paul just mentioned, uh, we've kind of decided to rethink our approach. So instead of trying to like solve problems right away, we're, we're taking a step back and we're, we're trying to think about how we can avoid premature stand, standardization. We don't want to solve problems that don't really need to be solved and re really just kind of focus on the specific functionality that we want to build to meet real specific needs. So we've decided to kind of work backwards from specific problems into something bigger only where necessary. We're not, you know, we're not looking to solve all of the problems. We've got a few use cases that seem very, very clear that are that are well defined. That, you know, we're seeing users and other community members um, continuously bring up, and we're trying to figure out how can we just address those real concrete use cases and just see kind of what what evolves organically beyond that. So, so let's talk about cluster set. So. Note that even though it looks like the other Kubernetes set resources you, you may be used to seeing, this is a pre-API concept. It does not currently correspond uh, to a real resource, um, but it's a useful concept to talk about. So a cluster set represents a pattern of use that we see. That is a group of clusters governed by a single authority uh, that could be a team, a company, 
any organization, even an individual, but some set of clusters uh, around which you can create concrete statements um, owned by someone who can make basically uh, absolute decisions about the behavior of this cluster set. Within the set, we see a high degree of trust. Think about this as, a, as the extension of the trust that you'd see uh, with, within a single cluster. Not necessarily a case where, you know, uh, everything can talk to everybody or everything needs to be exposed, but you should consider, you know, running applications in the same cluster set if you would run them in the same cluster. That doesn't mean they need to talk to each other. Um, you know, obviously there are still permissions and stuff in play, um, but, you know, owned by that same authority uh, who feels comfortable running these, these applications together. We also introduced the concept of namespace sameness. Um, this applies across all clusters in the set. And what this means is that permissions and the various characteristics of a namespace are consistent uh, across all of the clusters in a cluster set for a given namespace. That is, you shouldn't have namespace foo be used for one thing and have one meaning in one cluster and in another cluster in the same set have it used and, and mean something else with completely different ownership. Um, namespace should be that primitive that you use to share ownership across clusters um, and should behave consistently um, in, each, uh, in each cluster in which they're deployed. That said, namespaces don't necessarily have to exist in every cluster. It's just that any cluster they exist in, they should be, behave in roughly the same way. So one of the first use cases for this cluster set is the multi-cluster uh, services API. So this started as a KEP and has kind of been evolving um, to alpha right now. But basically, um, services are a multi-cluster building block. Uh, it's a specific problem, but it's a specific problem that basically everybody has in the multi-cluster case. How do I extend the service concept to multiple clusters? So it builds on the concept of namespace sameness and allows that single service to span or be consumed by multiple clusters with a, within a cluster set in a similar way to the way you would uh, consume a cluster IP service in a single cluster uh, today. Um, we just wanted to focus on the API and common behavior. So we didn't define an implementation. Uh, we left a lot of room for implementers to make different decisions, uh, but we wanted to focus on that basic API and behavior that, that means that whenever you use this API with any implementation on any platform or however you want to deploy it, you get similar characteristics and can kind of count on um, on a standard behavior. And we've, we actually see a few implementations in progress already. Um, we have uh, Submariner has been working on uh, an implementation with Submariner Lighthouse. Uh, we had a demo at the SIG uh, from Cisco showing their implementation of the API. And we've even seen uh, Istio has plans to uh, introduce the API in, a, in an upcoming release. The control plane in our design can be centralized or decentralized, but consumers only ever rely on local data. And this is a big point. So we left open for all of those, you know, uh, implementations I, uh, I mentioned and any more that may come, um, the way that you build your control plane is not dictated by the API, uh, but we did want to make it uh, consistent that consumers only ever have to rely on, on cluster local data um, when consuming a service. Uh, we're, we're in alpha right now on the way to beta, but we'd love your input. So come by our meetings, join our group, uh, give us your feedback. Another project that's in flight right now within the SIG is uh, what we call the work API. So this is a different pattern for distributing resources than the one that we previously identified that was in use in Federation. Um, so instead of distributing individual resources, uh, the, the main idea of the work API is that you'll distribute a collection of resources that are related to one another. So uh, think about the difference between uh, distributing a single deployment uh, to many clusters versus distributing a deployment. Maybe it's got a secret or config map that it references. Maybe there's a service in front of that deployment um, and you'd want to distribute those things together. So I'll also just add that this is a pre-alpha state right now with the KEP that's coming together. So um, you should not expect uh, when you go and look at that, that you'll see a, a super featureful thing being described because we are working backwards 
with the initial concentration on finding the right API surface to model this problem for a single cluster. So if we think about, um, if we think about taking away all the dimensions of scheduling and having overrides and, uh, you know, powerful selection primitives for where something should go and just think about how would we want to make sure that we applied a collection of some resource on a cluster and we had a meaningful status about that work, no pun intended, a meaningful status about whether those resources had been fully applied, was there a problem? That's sort of where our initial concentration lies. Um, and if we think about working backwards from that sort of leaf node in the problem of how do I do this correctly on a single cluster, we can sort of think about things like um, higher level primitives than just uh, work for a single cluster like scheduling to a set uh, or scheduling to some part of a cluster set or defining a primitive that allows us to specify overrides if we want to do that uh, type of thing. But if we start walking backwards, thinking about those higher level problems, we start to touch this sort of registration concept or at least identity concept around having a coordinate to use in reference to a particular cluster where something should be scheduled. Um, so this is still a work in process. We are work in progress. We, we need your input. Uh, and I sense that there's probably fairly strong chance that maybe one or two people at least watching this presentation have, have built something like work API before, or at least are interested. So please come and join us. Uh, we'd love to have you participate. And I do want to give some shout outs here. Um, shout out to Valerie. Uh, Lancy for her contributions in catalyzation uh, to get the ball rolling on this and also shout out to Chojin uh, for his contributions moving things forward and drafting a cap. So we come back to this kind of central question and problem again that it's easy to think about a cluster registry-like thing, it's really hard to materialize in a functional, functional software. The boundaries aren't clear. It's tempting to build first because it seems easy. Um, and for those reasons and our you know, previous history, attempting to solve problems uh, in that neighborhood, we're just going to avoid characterizing a registry as a first step um, and avoid that gravity that uh, I think it's pretty safe to say, Jeremy, that we still feel the tug of that gravity sometime in the SIG, but we need some coordinate to use in APIs. What coordinate would that be? So we're talking about the, the concept of a cluster ID. And so the trick here is we do not have a registry API. So how do we come up with a coordinate without a registry API? And what we're looking at is taking that step back uh, and trying to come up with the, the real common use case. And really what we need is a, a way to just uniquely identify a cluster within a cluster set for the lifetime of membership. So this isn't attempting to define the identity uh, of a cluster forever. Um, you know, we want to confine the scope to the cluster set, that boundary within which we we already kind of have some use cases and can reason about. It does seem that this ID needs to be discoverable within the cluster. So, you know, we want a cluster to know who it is relative to the cluster set. We want to give a reference for multi-cluster tooling to build on within the cluster. Um, so, you know, there's some characteristics that we want there. You know, for example, having the, the ID be a valid DNS label. This is something that's important to, to the multi-cluster service. Um, having a way to disambiguate backends for headless services between clusters. Um, other uses are maybe a coordinate to use for scheduling work uh, with the work API. Uh, 
or, or just an annotation for metrics and logs so that you can determine uh, which cluster is, is you know, potentially having problems in aid and debugging. Um, but again, we're kind of taking a step back and, and trying not to solve optional problems and really just get to that basic consistent use case that we need um, in order to enable kind of the next level of multi-cluster tooling. So in case it's not clear, we need and want your input. We'd love to have you have you involved uh, in, in our part of the community, share your use cases, problems, your ideas, and you can check out our homepage. It's under uh, SIG Multicluster in community. We've got a Slack channel also called SIG Multicluster and hold on to your hat because we have a list, which is also called Kubernetes SIG Multicluster. And if you'd like to join us for our meetings, they're Tuesday, 12.30 Eastern, 9.30 Pacific time. We hope to see you there. And let me be the first to say thank you for coming and watching our talk. Thank you very much. We appreciate it.